All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is the introduction to affordable housing development and finance learning lab um, brought to you by the California Housing Partnership and Community Economics. We're really excited to be here today. Um, and thanks for joining us. Um, and we'll get started just by briefly introducing ourselves. Um, so my name is Adrian Jemhart, and I'm a housing finance consultant with the California Housing Partnership. Denise. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Wint, Vice President of Real Estate Development with EAH Housing. Diana. I'm Diana Downton. I'm an affordable housing finance consultant with Community Economics. John. Uh, my name is John Egan. I'm the principal architect at Egan Simon Architecture. And I'm Michelle Espinosa Coulter. I am a senior housing finance consultant with California Housing Partnership. Excellent. So we'll just talk a little bit um, just briefly about um, the California Housing Partnership and our mission. Um, so our mission is to create and preserve affordable and sustainable homes for Californians with low incomes by providing um, financial and policy solutions to our nonprofit and public partners. So the California Housing Partnership um, provides both financial consulting as well as policy and uh, policy and research for preservation and sustainable housing. Um, and we do have this really handy housing data tools um, that shows um, a map of affordable housing properties as well as our housing needs dashboard. And here's the website if you wanna check that out. All right, on to some, just some quick housekeeping. Um, so we're all pretty used to Zoom by now, um, but we ask that you rename yourself with your name, your pronouns and your organization. Um, please use the chat feature to ask any questions, and we will have some chat prompts, um, and you can respond to those in, in the chat. Um, we'll also have some polls pop up, so please respond to those um, as they come. And keep your sound on mute and only un unmute yourself when speaking. And if you want to keep your camera on, that's great, um, and, but that's up to you. All right, our first poll question, I'll hand it off to Michelle for this. Um, so in addition to moderating, my role in this learning lab is going to be to periodically pop in with context and observations from my years of experience in development. And that's because under the topic of affordable housing development and finance, there are definitions and lists and defined steps, and you'll he hear all about those here. But so much of what a project manager does is extemporaneous. And one's decision making is often influenced by something deeper than one's training. So at this time, I'd like to ask what about affordable housing development resonates with you the most? And please select only one. Are you or do you aspire to be a community builder, a numbers and pro forma expert, a placemaker who's focused on design, architect, and urban streetscape? or a policy maker who's constantly thinking about the laws and regulations that shape the need for affordable housing. We've already got a lot of responses and about 50% of you so far, we have a lot of community builders, about 12% numbers and pro forma experts, about 12% placemakers and about 27% policy makers. All right, so while, the, while those answers continue to come in, we will move into the agenda. All right, thanks, Michelle. So here's an agenda of the journey that we're gonna go on together today. So we're gonna start off with an overview of, of affordable housing and what affordable housing is. Um, we'll look at the, the project life cycle um, which will go into the various phases um, of a project's life, um, including site selection, um, project concept, land use and design, construction, lease up and operations. And we'll also go into financing and pro formas and we'll have um, some great exercises as well. All right, and on to the overview. 
So what are we talking about today? What type of housing? So rather than market rate housing, today we're focusing on affordable housing. Um, in the world of affordable housing, um, we could either be talking about home ownership or rental. And today we're focusing just on affordable rental housing. Um, and all of the, the housing that we're talking about today is permanent housing rather than um, housing that is transient or transitional such as um, shelters, dormitories, or other um, not permanent forms of housing. Okay, so now that we know we're just talking about affordable rental housing, let's go a little bit deeper. Um, so maybe you've heard of naturally occurring affordable housing, public housing, um, or rent subsidized housing. So rather than those, uh, those types of affordable housing, we're just going to be focusing on publicly financed and subsidized affordable housing um, that uses the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. What the acronym you can see there is, is LITEC. So that's, that's where our focus is going to be today. Okay, so here's a, a view, an overview of our statewide LITEC production. Um, so this, this graph comes from um, the California Housing Partnership from our 2021 housing needs assessment. And then just a note that, that our 2022 needs assessment was just released, if you wanna take a look at that. So this graph shows um, a boom in low-income housing tax credit production in the most recent year shown here, which is 2020. Um, and in 2020, 225 projects using low-income housing tax credits were approved for development. Um, so in, in recent years, less than half that many projects occurred each year. Um, so something we're going to be talking about um, throughout this presentation is that, that it takes often years for projects to move forward, get funded, and break ground. Um, so many project managers will spend, spend their time on only a handful of projects, considering the amount of time that they each take. Um, so the details on these projects can be um, overwhelming, um, and, and there's a lot to think about when moving a project through, through the life cycle. So the goal of this training is really intended to provide context and perspective and to help boost your, um, your capacity. Okay, back to a little bit more information of what we're talking about today. So what does affordable mean? Affordable means that you are paying 30% or less of your household income towards rent and utilities. Um, so if you, you, maybe you've heard the words rent burden or severely rent burden. So if a household is rent burdened, that means that they're paying between 30 and 50% of their income on housing. Well, severely rent burden means that a household is paying more than 50% of their income on housing. And the definition of low income um, in the context of what we're talking about today is a household that is making 80% or less of the area median income. Um, an area median income is usually based on um, um, data from that county. So it's, it's often countywide, which we'll look at a little bit in this next slide. So for this is um, Los Angeles County in 2021. You can see the, the average, um, the median household income for um, households of four members and one member. And here we're showing 100% of AMI, 50% of AMI, and 30% of AMI. So a, a household of four making 30% of AMI, um, their median income is $36,000 a year with a monthly income of $3,000. Um, and so for that household, affordable would mean $900 a month on rent. Um, so this is just an example of um, what kind of incomes we're, we're looking at and the rents that we're targeting when, when we're developing affordable housing. I'll pass it on to Michelle to cover a couple slides. I think I'd be better at this after two years. Um, we've def defined the specific industry and the general target population. And now I'd like to provide some framework for the project manager role. 
Development of affordable housing requires a highly cooperative cross-functional team effort. Your team will always include the specialties shown here, as well as a dozen or more other specialties. The team provides the infrastructure and tool used, tools used every day to manage risk. Some team members will ask the entire project and others will provide discrete deliverables during specific phases of development. The project manager's role is to lead the work of the team to achieve a financially sustainable development within the given constraints of money, time, and development scope. Your role is to piece together each team member's knowledge and understanding of risk and apply that to your project in the most efficient and effective manner you can. Communication is key. A lot of money is spent on the time and a good PM will both lean into the advice of the team and think critically about that advice and their deliverables. The first task of the team is to hone the project concept to meet your constraints because ill-defined and too tightly prescribed concepts can be detrimental to decision-making and the overall project. A project life cycle typically varies uh, or lasts between four and seven years, though I've certainly had projects that have go, gone longer. The first year is spent honing the concept. Another year or two is spent on feasibility and pre-development. That includes site control, assembling the team, design and entitlements, and applying for and securing financing. This says 12 to, four, to 24 months for construction. It's been a while since I've seen construction wrap up in 12 months. So I'm gonna say 15 to probably 30 months for construction. Lease up, depending on your target and who's helping you with coordinate with entry, that can last anywhere between three and six months. And then operations will be for another 15 years, I'm sorry, 55 years. Sometime during that time period, you're probably going to need to recapitalize your project and do some rehabilitation work. Um, and that's sometime during the 55 years. This leads us to our first chat question. And if you'll respond in the chat, then we'll be discussing the question with Denise Went towards the end of the entire uh, lab. When deciding on a new project from scratch, what have you seen happen first? In other words, what has your development organization done first? Have they identified funding sources and then gone after a site that fit those sources? Have they seen what funding source comes next on the HCD calendar? Have they identified the site first? Or have they researched land use and state density bonus laws to decide which kinds of sites to go after? Or have they done things like establish minimum and maximum unit counts or establish a target, target population? With that, like I said, I'm gonna monitor the chat. And we'll give right. Denise and Adrian will take from here. So now we're gonna go into feasibility and pre-development a bit. So we'll talk a little bit about site selection, financing and design and entitlements. Um, with Diana covering most of financing and, and John covering a lot of design and entitlements. All right, so site selection. It's a very key piece to um, really the concept of your project. Um, so your site can either be found internally by your organization. Um, perhaps you're working with a broker who helps to find your site. Um, another way to to get a site is through an RFP or a request for a proposal, um, often from um, a public agency that, that might be looking for developers. I finally got it, thanks. Um, that might be looking for developers to, to turn a site into affordable housing for the community. So when looking at a site, a couple of things to pay attention to are if the site is in a DDA, which is a difficult to develop area or a QCT, a qualified census tract, or an opportunity area. Um, so this will, in the world of TCAC and SIDLAC, this will affect your um, scoring and also um, your tax credits. 
Um, so some another item to pay attention to is the market rents. Um, so are the market rents high or low in the area, which will also impact um, the rents that you can charge. Um, and what kind of amenities are near the site? Um, so are there are there schools nearby, grocery stores, medical care, transportation, um, as this will also impact um, both the the quality of life of your residents and also competitiveness um, for your your project when you are applying for funding. All right, so other things to think about in the site selection process um, is the the length of your escrow. So that is something to negotiate. Um, with the owner of the site, um, the deposit, so the timing of deposits and also the amount um, and contingency releases. Um, very important is, is the due, digital, due diligence process um, when, when taking a look at your site to see if development on the site is feasible. So are there um, any environmental conditions that would make development um, more expensive or difficult? Um, is there any relocation needed? Um, are you in a flood area? Are there any issues with the title search um, as well as utilities and, and also the zoning of the site? So, so the zoning of the site really gets at what is allowable um, on that site. All right, housing type. So what drives your housing type? And, and housing types um, may be one of um, the, the types listed here. So large family, special needs, SRO or single room occupancy, at risk, senior or acquisition rehab. Um, so what is the mission of your organization? Um, it's definitely important to make sure that the, the type of project you're working on aligns with your mission. Um, perhaps the community or local political leaders are interested in a certain type of housing. Um, the market study. So what can what can be supported in the area that you're looking to develop in, um, as well as the partners you're working on, um, available resident services, um, and lease up processes. So these are all factors to consider when you're deciding what type of housing type you'll be moving forward with. As you know, housing priorities change from one administration to the next. 10 years ago, redevelopment agencies, i.e. local agencies, were responsible for driving housing policy. Um, and they often emphasized families and neighborhood development. Now, with the new administration, the state has prioritized housing for the homeless as well as housing located in places that mitigate the effects of climate change. And you'll see that here in the chart. So what I'd like you to keep in mind is that except for deeply cost-effective developments, it's difficult to develop housing that's not aligned with the government's, the governing administration policies. And with that, I'm going to transition to John Egan and let me introduce John Egan very quickly. He has been a leader in the industry for almost 30 years. He's a principal of Egan Simon Architecture and has designed and construction managed innumerable affordable housing developments across California. Now to John. All right, I think you need to let me share screen. All right, uh, so today what I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of the preliminary design process that we go through on a project. Uh, the idea is to allow developers to understand some of the thoughts and processes that the architect uh, follows. Uh, typically in the beginning of a project, we're, we'll have the developer come to us with a site uh, and we start our due diligence. And the question that we receive from the developer is essentially, how many units can I fit on this site? And uh, they've got a minimum number that they're looking for. They have a type, uh, they have a bedroom count. Uh, and the idea is, can we, can we fit this uh, concept onto a site? Uh, 
so we enter into site analysis. Uh, now, the basis of the conversation I'm going to present to you is, is based on Los Angeles, where our office is located. Uh, we work throughout the state, so each area does have similar zoning and uh, restrictions associated to, to sites. Uh, so it's just a question of how you apply them. Uh, some areas have uh, square footage based lot requirements in terms of unit counts. Others have form based codes. Uh, if you don't know the difference between the two, uh, for example, Los Angeles has a lot size uh, uh, requirement per unit. And uh, then you're going to receive density bonuses uh, associated to the affordable housing percentage that you provide. Uh, that'll get your number of units higher. Other communities have form-based codes, which is where you build an envelope of what's allowable based on the uh, setbacks of the site and the height allowances of the site. And then you see how many units you can fit within uh, that envelope. Uh, then you can still apply your density bonuses and go from there. Um, so this is giving you a general chart, which is associated to the different zoning types, uh, giving you, you an idea of where we start. Uh, typically for an affordable housing development, it's going to be an R3 uh, or higher usage to allow for the higher level of densities. Uh, and we're also then looking at what the height overlay zone is going to be for the site to see how many stories we can fit in. Uh, we have a kind of a general rule, which is that uh, the building can be based on the financing and, and what we hear from the owner up to uh, five stories of wood frame construction, uh, which is a type three construction. Uh, typically we only have one level of subterranean parking, but we try to avoid it. If if, it, if we can do on-grade parking, that's more efficient. Uh, and then at times we'll have one level of podium deck where the building is raised up by one level of concrete construction. When we go outside of those parameters, our experience has told us that the project ends up having financial construction impacts that are uh, negative. So if you have two levels of subterranean parking, that tends to be difficult unless your unit count is significantly higher. Um, and our, the building types that we work on are typically between 55 to 100 units. So uh, with two levels of subterranean parking, you're looking at a building type that would be 150 to 200, that might make sense. Um, so we'll just kind of move on to the next slide. Um, so that's the zoning. And then you also on top of your overlay site will have what's called the floor area ratio. That's the allowable size of the building on the basis of the actual property size. So if you have a 20,000 square foot building and you have a floor area ratio of three to one, you're going to be allowed to build a 60,000 square foot building. Uh, you, there is a basic established norm in the industry, which is that 15% of the building area is associated to circulation. So you can take your unit type and then uh, multiply that by the size of the unit, the number of the units, and then add 15%. And you can see if your site uh, kind of passes a preliminary threshold associated to uh, identifying a proper site location. Next one to check, lot coverage. So uh, some of the areas you'll find will say that you have to maintain a certain amount of area for the site open to the sky. Uh, and you can get it, we've seen areas that have say 50% uh, or it could be less. Uh, City of Los Angeles in some areas has lot coverage restrictions. In other areas, it's just based upon the required setbacks for the lot itself. Okay, uh, density bonuses. There's all kinds of different density bonuses right now. Um, the basic you know, question is, are you going to do your 35% maximum density bonus? Most of the people I believe on this call probably are based on 100% affordable projects. Uh, you would be receiving the highest level of density bonus for yours. Uh, it depends on the area that you're in as to how they're going to do this. Uh, it's tied to the assembly bills, the original assembly bill was 1818. Uh, the 
this allowed for a bonus from 25 to 20 percent um, and it also i believe uh, reduced parking allowances um, so and then assembly bill seven, assembly bill 744 um, allowed for 100 percent rental units uh, to be developed and reduction in parking there as well gets to the next assembly bill we keep on going through these There'll be a new one by the time you do your application, trust me. Uh, so, you know, I kind of go through the assembly, assembly bills relatively quickly because they actually change at least every 12 to 18 months. There's a new assembly bill out there. There's a new reference and people are, are using a different assembly bill for incentives. Um, the general concept is that uh, you're going to get 35% density bonus. And we may need to take certain incentives associated to setbacks or height and the different assembly bills that you have in essence allow you to do that as well as parking reductions. All of which have to be put forward to uh, the community that you're building in uh, to explain to them what it is that you're proposing on your site uh, and why it's allowed uh, depending on the community you're developing in they will either be more acquainted with uh, density bonuses and allowances in the code for exceeding height and things of that nature, or they will be less experienced. Uh, there's nothing wrong with either of the two. It's just that you need to communicate very clearly with your planners and your building department officials uh, what your intentions are so that you can get your, your project queued up. All right, transit-oriented communities. This is, applies to Los Angeles. There's probably some overlays in other cities, San Francisco and LA, things of that nature. Um, TOC allows for the idea of increased density around transit-oriented uh, features. Uh, one of the things to be weary of if you're building in Los Angeles is that the uh, this is based upon crossover of bus lines. Uh, and adjacencies to rapid transit stations. Uh, we've had project sites where during the development of the project, a bus line has changed. Uh, and there is abilities to make reservations for overlays. And this would apply to any type of a density overlay based upon being located near a transit hub. Uh, but again, you have to communicate with your building department and your planning officials, and you have to uh, make sure that you have a, a documented reservation in place. Uh, you can find that if you can be a year into a project and then the city turns and says, this is no longer a tier three project, it's a tier two project and uh, your density is impacted. Uh, and I'm saying that from experience, it's happened. You work around it because obviously city officials are there to help you build affordable housing. At the same time, it, it is, uh, you, they now have a reservation program for that. Uh, this is giving you, based upon the TOC incentives, the basis for different increases in height. Uh, it takes you all the way from density to the FAR that we already talked about, residential parking ratios, uh, and then also it gives you the ability to reduce your ground floor commercial uh, that's based upon mixed use buildings, which are you know, quite a bit of the model that is being built currently, um, where you have a ground floor minimum square footage that is required in order to um, build a larger mixed use project in a, in a urban dense area. Um, this is again, specific to Los Angeles. Again, heights, height increases, additional stories. You're also able to have additional stories via your density bonus regulations. I'll show you that shortly in a second. And then a summary of the, densi of the density bonuses. This is for the transit-oriented communities. And most cities of, of size will have an overlay associated to building near transit. Okay, TOC. FAR incentives, again, just giving you the number that you increase. You can see in tier one, you have a 40% increase. As you're getting uh, into a higher level of uh, overlay in relation to uh, 
Public transportation, tier four, allows you for an increase of up to 55%. Uh, and that can be substantial uh, in terms of the impact in the overlay of, of the zoning, because you, you will find that you will have a site which is, you know, has a limitation of a two to one four area ratio, but because of, of locations associated to adjacency of transportation, you, you can get bounced up to 4.25, which uh, is the make or break on a project. And then again, the lot coverage increase. So you get up to in increases on lot coverage as well for lot centers. One of the things in general to be re recognized is transitional height incentives. This, this slide is associated to the TOC, um, but this does apply to uh, overlay zones of all different types. Uh, and that is at which point do you, does your envelope or your building set back associated to adjacent property? What, you'll, what we have found, we had this occur where we had a historic property adjacent to us. Uh, and the city came and asked that we had a uh, setback associated to view and light preservation. Um, in that case, it was not directly associated to the underlying zoning, and it was a requirement placed upon us by the city, but it can have a very serious impact on your project. As you can see, uh, these are three different diagrams associated to three different levels at which you have setback occurring. And um, so what you're going to want to do is um, make sure that your setback doesn't impact your envelope. So obviously, the, if you look at the tier one and two, you can see that that envelope impacts it heavily, whereas on the tier four, it's impacting it less. Um, these are three project examples I'm going to show you as to how they were impacted. The Beverly Terrace Apartments uh, is family housing, uh, one and two bedrooms. The Rise Apartments and the Alvarado Ken Apartments are uh, single room occupancies for previously homeless. Uh, the Rise Apartment is now built and the Alvarado Kent Project, I believe, is in the pipeline. So the station area neighborhood, this is neighborhood overlay maps. Uh, the reason that this is important is that you'll see how that can impact your overall site envelope. This is the Beverly Terrace Project and a study that we had to do associated to envelope. The uh, lighter colors on top, the lighter magenta, the lighter uh, yellow, and the lighter uh, green, that is what was allowed to be built by standard code. And the darker shades below are what we were able to add associated to uh, the affordable housing bonuses. Um, the building was adjacent to a, an apartment complex and had setback requirements associated to distance from an adjacent uh, R3 uh, zone that was part of the overlay for the neighborhood. So you have to be very careful of that. The reason that this blue building is taller is, is that that's actually sitting on a separate lot. So you're looking at a project that's on two separate zones and two different uh, area neighborhood plans all of which was tied together as one and was impacted by uh, an adjacent structure which uh, limited the density of the site. So gives you a little idea of, of, of the research to do. Uh, in addition to that, we had to review the street that we were on for highway dedication. So you should check your streets when you're in an area that has street widening potential. Uh, in the case of our lot, uh, we did have street widening that was going to be required. Uh, however, we went further and found that there was a historic structure further down the street that limited the street widening. So we were able to get the street widening waived to allow for us to have more units on the site. Um, but this turns out to be a class two highway and uh, has a minimum width, which would have cut uh, a good 10 feet out of the project site. So. Uh, by avoiding that, we were able to build uh, probably an extra three or four units for the site. Next item is a very critical one. This, I cannot emphasize this enough. Power lines. 
moving power lines is very expensive. Um, so you wanna make sure that you understand it. Uh, in relation to our site, uh, we had offsite power lines. And uh, so you have to have 10 feet clear of your building uh, for uh, clearances from the power line. And that's not from the center line of the pole. It's actually from the conductor that's on the outside of the arm on the pole. Uh, and, and it can impede your site. You can see where I have the property line located on this diagram. Uh, and that can actually uh, impact the envelope of your structure. And this is for high voltage lines, uh, which have a tendency to arc electricity. So, you know, they're not going to let you build within a certain distance of that. That's going to be based upon each of your utility providers, whether it's uh, SoCal Edison or uh, Los Angeles DWP or another utility group. Uh, they're going to be following uh, the standards associated to clearances and distances, and you need to check on that. The next critical one to look at is how are you going to deal with your vehicle aspect in and out? And you may say, well, we're not going to have parking because we're 100% affordable and we're not having parking because of our density bonus rules. And I would say that you're going to have parking because you may have social services on site and you do not get out of the social services uh, working uh, worker parking. So we need to make sure that you are thinking about how you access your driveway. Uh, th this site was a uh, corner lot, five-way intersection, and on a hill descending in downhill uh, from the top here, down and around the corner. And we had to determine where we were going to have our parking entry. Uh, just note that you have to have 20 feet minimum after you exit the street and to get to a point where you have a gate for a parking lot because you're not allowed to create a queue on the street. So if you're looking at your plans from your architect and they've got a gate right up at the property line, that more than likely won't happen uh, in, an, in an urban area that has a lot of traffic. So th this is showing you kind of an enlarged area of the driveway and the 20 feet setback that you'll need associated to queuing cars as the cars come in and out of the site. Okay, your transformer position. Okay, so you can't build under it and you can't build above it unless you do a vault inside of a building. You do a vault inside of a building, 150 to more thousands of dollars to add to your project. We like to try and put transformers outside so that we can do other things with those dollars that are more beneficial than a transformer vault inside a building. But if you put it outside, you have to be sure that you have all of the clearances associated to not just the transformer itself, uh, but also the maintenance requirements uh, that, that you have. Um, the, the maintenance uh, requirements and access requirements can actually uh, require that you end up having uh, vehicular access uh, associated to curb cuts, uh, truck access, um, and it's potentially larger than the actual transformer space itself. So uh, it can typically be offsite uh, in the past. However, recently in Los Angeles, they've been asking for it to be on site. But uh, as of, I believe, three months ago, they are providing a waiver for affordable housing to allow them to have the maintenance area uh, outside the property line again. Uh, the reason they wanted it on site was is that they, they didn't want to have the liability of damaging the sidewalks So when they're doing maintenance on a transformer. So uh, the, the Department of Water and Power was increasing the size of these transformers by about twice. And to give you an idea, you have a five-story building, that's five units right there that you're knocking out of the building because you can't build over it. Uh, and if it's twice as large, it's going to have a higher impact as well. Transformer positioning is as important. In the case of the project you're looking at, we placed the transformer at the rear of the lot, and we had to put a pull box in at the front of the lot, all of which required access, all of which had to be open to the sky to allow for long-term maintenance. You're not typically allowed to pull transformer high voltage lines underneath a building. Uh, 
Uh, once it goes into the building and it goes into the main electrical room, that's fine. But outside, when you're coming from the power lines, you typically cannot go under. This is just a nice diagram of all the transformer information you could ever want. So, all right, the corner sights and view angles. Uh, so our building is here in the center of the slide. Uh, and you'll note that uh, it's a difficult intersection. Uh, and the corner angle and view is something I want you to be aware of because this is going to apply to pretty much every city that you'll work in. And it's essentially saying that you, you cannot build inside of the angle of view that's required for the traffic to be safe. Uh, so, you know, if you think about these things we're discussing, we're discussing things that are impacting that envelope for the building that you've done your zoning analysis on that is uh, beyond the uh, standard norm. So, you know, you've got transformers you can't build over, you've got view angles you can't build over, you have power lines you can't build adjacent to, and all of these things are impacting that envelope. And all of them, if you don't have someone look at it early on, uh, can impact your unit count. And uh, from all of my experience, if the unit count's impacted, that's a really big problem. So, I keep going here. All right, uh, a little bit of schematic design and information for you there. Uh, this has to do with the parking and established parking requirements. Um, you're going with a zero parking requirement. Wonderful. Um, if you start to provide parking, understand that the electric vehicle parking is uh, in addition to parking requirements, maybe a slight overlay but that the ADA EV spaces for accessibility are in addition to the ADA standard requirements uh, based on, I believe that's the 2010 ADA requirement. Um, this is a standard chart for parking ratios. Summary of different parking ratios, just so you understand that your uses are very important to, to strategize. When you go in for a mixed use project, they will ask you what is the use associated to the parking. Uh, if you say to them that you're building a, re a restaurant inside your commercial space, they're gonna want, you know, and this is again, Los Angeles, but it would apply to other places. They would want one uh, parking space per 100 square feet. However, if you go in and you say, well, we're doing an office space on the ground floor, it's one space per 500 square feet. Uh, and that can be a massive difference in relation to a mixed use process. So just understand that when you're running your background performance, you have to understand how that works. This is giving you, again, the minimum standards for the electric vehicle charging station, stations. These are the ones that are required to comply with Chapter 11B. Um, and you can see here, they've got on the left, the total number of EV spaces, and then the minimum number that are required to comply of each type. And again, when you're laying out your parking, there are significant differences in how these spaces work. Uh, we have now started to lay out our parking to allow for a full accessible path at the front of the parking spaces when you have EV charging stations, uh, which again can impact you pretty heavily. Gives you an idea of how tight the parking can be in different accessible parking spaces. Bicycle parking can be extremely tight. This project was uh, went through the planning department during the changes to bicycle parking. Uh, so we were doing a parking reduction and providing bicycle parking spaces. Um, the uh, city upgraded the number of bicycle parking spaces required while we were in plan check. When that type of thing happens, you end up having bicycle parking spaces in very unusual spaces. Uh, this was essentially the entry lobby from the garage. We were able to squeeze in a couple bicycle parking spaces, but uh, was not the preferred location, but we were maxed out on the site and we really had to put them wherever we could that would be accessible. Whereas in the next project we're doing, you can see that there's a much more functional layout for bicycle parking. 
They do take up quite a bit of space and they do require maintenance areas within them. Uh, if you look at the size of the bicycle parking and you compare that to the size of the rec room that's in the corner, you'll see that the bicycle parking and the rec room are pretty much the same size. So um, depending on what your bicycle parking regulations are, they take up quite a bit of area. Okay. Outdoor space. Rooftop outdoor space, extremely expensive. Try to avoid it if you can. Try to have your outdoor space on the lowest levels possible. It increases costs pretty dramatically. Um, this is a rooftop garden terrace. And then you can see as we get to the next building that we're working on, we're looking at all ground floor area for calculating outdoor space. And that's based upon how much is required per unit. Trash and recycling, vertical elements that run through the whole building, they take up quite a bit of space. If you have commercial uses within the building, you may find that you have to have separate trash and recycling, which a lot of people do not think about. Uh, so another item that limits your building location and the trash and recycling has to be able to be accessed from the street typically. Almost at the end here, Michelle. So don't worry. Um, low impact development. This is the rainwater catch basin systems. You have got to think about this now. You've got to think about this very early. Uh, you need to start calculating areas of planters. The planters have to be. If you look at the one at the lower upper left, it's adjacent to the structure to allow for rainwater to be caught in in it and for filtration. The planters that are floating in the middle that are very nice planters on a courtyard deck, those cannot really be accessed well for low impact water filtration because you can't get the drain, drainage to them because they're in the middle of the courtyard. So, so that can really impact how you lay out your entire site. Now, low impact development's done many ways. This is one that has filtration planters in an urban dense environment where the site is pretty much property line to property line. Other areas where you have larger areas of land, it'll be more effective to uh, do, you know, a, either an underground percolation system outside the building envelope, or you know, possibly do uh, these uh, larger uh, swales where you you filter the water uh, on the surface. So, quick mention just on exterior building maintenance systems for you guys. Uh, Forget an exterior building maintenance system in California. I've now had this happen from San Rafael to LA. Uh, you have to re basically rework the structure of the roof. Uh, the exterior building maintenance system is the window washer system. It's required over four stories by OSHA. And uh, the individual connection at the roof essentially can hold 5,000 pounds in any direction. So it's not a small load that they put on the roof. And if you miss it, uh, the structural engineer is going to end up having to add beams and all kinds of anchors during construction. And it will be the most, one of the more significant change orders you ever see. Um, fresh air intake. Uh, this is important to be for your architects to be thinking about, but uh, it has to do with basically you're required now to bring fresh air into each unit. If you're adjacent to a highway, or you have a sound rated area, you're gonna have difficulty having the fresh air just go directly from the outside wall. This building was three blocks away from a freeway. So the outside air filtration had to be done separately. Something to think about. And that gets in kind of the sound transmission values. There's HUD requirements for housing. A lot of folks now are starting to do sound tests. It's starting to impact their quality of their sound ratings on their windows. Uh, and the last slide I have is associated to wall types. Uh, your architect relies on wall types associated to sound ratings. Uh, but what you'll find is that the structural engineer is going to add plywood. And when he adds that plywood to both sides of a wall, it becomes a drum and you lose your sound rating. So uh, that overlay of how sound ratings work can be extremely important to do. So that that was my uh, that's my last slide, Michelle. Okay, I want to ask you. I, I love 
I love having um, John in particular go through uh, all of what the architect uh, gets involved in. It is significant. And um, I, the, the folks that answered the survey about what, what draws you to affordable housing, few of you said placemaking, all of you said, a lot of you said community building. And though it wasn't an option, um, even fewer said, you know, engineering the building, um, which gets to the importance of your team and the importance of your team in managing and mitigating the risk, the very significant risk that's associated with building um, any type of housing development. Um, and I think it's something that we, that we all, you know, that we don't spend enough time thinking about. Um, but that's your it's going to be your job as a as a project manager is to um, bring in the advice of your of your team members and weigh them against your constraints of, of time and money. Yeah, what I would tell what I would tell you, Michelle, is that it's really important for the project managers to go through the you know if they're using a standard agreement from the uh, an AIA agreement with their architect to to look at their agreement and establish what those milestones are for deliverables early on. Uh, because, you know, a, a, a project manager and development team that have experience uh, in housing, uh, they rely heavily on the architect. And at times, uh, you know, it takes everybody's eyes looking at things. I mean, we're, we try our best to, to not have you know, pitfalls and mistakes, but I'm pretty sure that most veteran developers will say that they've had a project where there was some sort of a glitch in the zoning or some sort of a glitch in the unit count, uh, things that are, can be really detrimental to a project. And, um, you know, what we're finding now is, is, is that the projects are and the requirements and the code requirements and the lender requirements are becoming uh, extremely heavy. Uh, which is fine. It just means that there's a lot more due diligence to do in terms of trying to make sure everything is included within a design package. Uh, and those milestones in a contract are really important. Uh, you know, to make sure that you have your, your sit down meetings and you review your design with the architect, whether it's a Zoom call or, or in person. And uh, you, you try to make sure that everything's really lined up for the project properly. Definitely. John, there were a couple of questions that came up that I just want you to, to um, address if you, if, you, if you would like. Um, one is about um, a movement towards not drawing natural gas into buildings, but instead um, relying on electric uh, throughout, except for in some of the main boilers. That's one we're, we're working on a project now in uh, Santa Monica, which is uh, renovation and it's taking the building from having gas wall heaters and gas fire boilers, and uh, we're moving it to uh, all electric there. Um, if you can do that, it's, I think, much better for the environment. Uh, anytime we can remove, you know, a greenhouse gas emission basis, uh, that's, I think, better for California in general. Uh, depending on the types of systems that you're putting in, uh, it, it can be, you can, you have to figure out how to make sure it functions within the building in terms of the pricing. So, you know, if anytime you're gonna, you're gonna try and take out a system that's considered traditional, the equipment manufacturers are really designing equipment that's, that's less expensive around it. Uh, so to say that it doesn't have a cost impact would just, would, would not necessarily be accurate at the same time uh, you're removing an entire system. So, you know, if you can do that, terrific. But, uh, you know, you tend to run into issues in laundry room equipment and things of that nature where you start to look at how efficient it is to have electric uh, laundry rooms if they're community laundry rooms and um, how long, how well those dryers work and things of that nature. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, something that you wait, you wait back and forth. Another question that came up was about um, filtration uh, and air conditioning systems. Um, I've certainly had projects come up where, we, where the municipalities wanted us to really 
up the filtration on the AC? We tend to run into a higher level of MERV filtration associated to being adjacent to uh, either freeway or even a train. So because you're trying to get particulate matter uh, out of uh, out of the system uh, associated to freeways and all of the pollution that comes with them, um, you can get it. It is it's I mean, look, it's better to have a higher level of filtration of air for the tenants. I mean, there's no way around saying that. It just is. However, as you do get higher up in those levels of filtration, again, the equipment is not necessarily uh, readily, it's not priced. It's priced to be a higher quality. It's a higher quality, and therefore the equipment's priced to be a higher quality piece of equipment. Um, but uh, you should push your envelope every time. You know, we do. We push the envelope every time. I think uh, in, our, in our projects, I think in terms of uh, you know lead design, I think we probably have done fifteen to twenty lead platinum projects at this point, and. And uh, we always push the envelope because the way we look at it is, is that if the more you put in in the beginning of the project, the more that's going to stay in the project. Uh, and there's always a, a, during a project, whether it's a, a project that's not designed with a you know, higher level of air filtration or higher level of uh, water filtration or gray water circulating system or solar hot water PV or electrical PV, or materials that are recyclable, um, you know, the whole um, you know, concept of renewable. Uh, if we don't put that in in the beginning, then it will never get into the project. Uh, so we put that into the project in the beginning. And then every project, whether you have those things in or not, ends up having a pricing scenario at the end of the project with the general contractor. In my experience, I, I don't think I've ever had a contractor tell me that we're under budget. Um, just someone, maybe someone here has some a contractor or they, they do it internally maybe, but generally speaking, the contractor absorbs every dollar and then you have to get the project into alignment with the budget. And uh, so the more you give up in the, during the process, you just it's just very, very hard to get it back. Um, there are, there's a, there's a couple of, there's a couple of juicy questions that I'm, I'm, um, weighing right now. Um, one of which is about remediation, building on sort of what may have started out as a dirty site, um, and, um, complications for, for you, uh, um, John. We... We had one project where a nonprofit group building affordable housing decided that they were going to do underground ventilation of the site for gas. Uh, the project started five years later because of waiting for the testing to come back positive, like positive in that it doesn't have the level of hydrocarbons that are required. Um, we've had uh, locations where we've had underground oil tanks from old gas stations. Uh, sometimes we assume that when they say that they found one, that there's one they didn't find. Uh, we always seem to find an extra one magically during construction. Uh, those I'm not, I don't get as worried about because you can, uh, you can have those you know, identify them to the fire department and you can effectively remove them and they basically just scoop up all the soil around it that may have been contaminated and they have what's called a sniffer that checks for the hydrocarbons in the air. The worst one that we had was when we were doing an overlay project with a school district. And the school district had requirements associated to environmental uh, uh, contaminants in the ground. And we started the excavation and recognized that the earth naturally had this contaminant in it. So that's something that everybody should really be aware of. This is that there are hydrocarbons that can get in there. There's, you know, from old gas stations or we've had plumes where you find out that there's a plume. Um, all of that should come out in your phase one and two. But um, the one that, that, that we didn't see was when we had a 
naturally occurring contaminants in the ground that had nothing to do with an outside source. Uh, and the impact of that on that project wasn't that significant. We, you know, there's, there's the school district said, okay, we're going to allow you to put in a vapor barrier for it, which we already had, because we were in a methane zone as well. Uh, but during the construction, it was a El Nino year and all of the water that went into the site during construction had to be remediated. So we had tanker trucks at the bottom and we were pumping the water from the site and filtering it uh, before we could release it into the storm drain system because of the school district requirements. So that cost a couple hundred thousand dollars of construction. So different types of contaminants. I'm going to jump in with a, a, a question. Somebody asked about the, the market studies and, and the gist of the question was, hey, it's affordable housing. How can a market study not support it? Um, thank you, John, by the way. Um, and I, I wanted to, to say a couple of things. First of all, um, a market study is a very specific document uh, and the requirements of it are found in the TCAC regulations. We're not going to go over them, but there's very there's multiple pages of requirements for market study, um, section 130, 10322 of the TCAC regs. Um, but you can't, so a market study is where your AMIs may be county-based, a market study is going to be more community-based. And so while something might be affordable in LA more generally, in the county, it might not be considered affordable in an area that's already naturally low income. And so um, market studies are those smaller locations. They're based on the smaller locations. Um, and so your rent in your building has to be 10% below the natural rent in that environment. And then also has a your rent per square foot also has a uh, cannot be more expensive than what naturally occurs in the in the market. That was sort of a, a brief way of saying you can't just put affordable housing anywhere and call it affordable housing. You have very specific neighborhood constraints that may cause you to have caps on rents that are um, below the sixty percent AMI that's normal in our developments. Denise, did you want to add anything to to that? I see a nod. <laughs> I was agreeing with what you were saying. And oftentimes in some neighborhoods too, that market study could help you really understand what people could afford. Because in some instances, I've seen it where the upper rent, let's say it's a 60% AMI level that we're targeting, may be unaffordable in that area. And so you may need to be able to bring it down some percentage points in order for it to be a truly affordable asset to that community that you're coming in to develop. Michelle, you're on mute. I am going to speak again, not muted. Um, and I'm gonna call time for a break. We're going to take a five minute break. We're going to say thank you so much to John Egan. And um, if you have any questions for John, I'm sure he'd be happy to field those. Uh, you know, find him at the conference. Are you at the conference right now, John? Or send him an email. No, nope, you can send an email. That's fine. Not at the conference next year, maybe. Very good. The news um, told me she was going. I probably would have, but you know, <laughs> All right, everybody. So um, why don't we reconvene? It's already 204. Why don't we reconvene at 210? And we will uh, start again with Adrian as our, um, our, our moderator in chief. And then we'll move into a segment by Diana. Thank you all. Okay. It's 2.10. All right, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna jump back in um, with a 
a quick chat question. Um, so which aspects of design have you seen upgraded or downgraded for budget reasons? So here are some options, landscaping, exterior finishes, interior finishes, furnishings, fixtures, and equipment, or if there's something else, um, please share that as well. And then we'll discuss these responses at the end um, a little bit later. Okay, so now we're gonna touch on uh, public funding and readiness and deal making and closing just briefly. Um, so public funding and readiness. Um, so when you are applying for public funding, some of the funding thresholds are listed here. Um, so that includes site control. So you need to show, show proof of site control. Um, you need to have your entitlements and the application will need to show financial feasibility so that you have enough funds to cover the costs of the project. Um, also, um, here are some due diligence items that, that will be looked at um, in order to secure that funding. Um, so, so once you've figured out your project is feasible um, and you just need funding in order to move forward, um, you know, it, it can take time to really build that capital stack. Um, so perhaps you've been through it before, um, applying to funding to HCD, um, TCAC and SIDLAC. If everything goes well in that process, um, you might be able to secure that funding in a year, but often it can take much longer with the level of competition that exists here in California. Um, so TCAC and SIDLAC are often the final funding applications and require readiness, um, which means the ability to start construction in around 180 days. Um, so when you get that, that award letter, that's when that clock starts. And so once you um, secure that funding, um, you're going to um, get a lender and investor in, on your team. Um, and start the closing process um, towards um, groundbreaking. Um, so the closing process is pretty similar to signing documents um, for buying a house. Um, so all the different parties come together and um, go through a due diligence process, um, looking at your construction drawings, your, um, you're getting your funding documents together, your limited partnership agreement, um, things like that. Um, and once you go through that, that process of closing that takes several months um, and let lenders and investors say, okay, it's okay to, to fund and move forward. Um, that's when we get to the groundbreaking process and construction can start. So we'll, we'll briefly go through construction, lease up and operations. Um, so as we talked about before, um, you've acquired your property, um, you have your, your project concept, um, and you're able to get funding, close on that construction financing, and break ground. Um, and then you can start construction. So as Michelle mentioned before, I've also never seen construction la only last 12 months. It's usually much longer. Uh, maybe my shortest project I've seen is about 16 months. Um, and can be longer than, than two years. So it is quite, um, quite a long and involved process. Um, so what does that construction process look like and, and who's involved? So you have your architect um, and your engineers um, with their role really uh, making sure that um, your plans are, are in order um, and they're responsible for modifying any plans and specs as needed. Um, making substitutions and, and value engineering. So, so that's a process of um, making changes in order to reduce cost. So your developer, um, if you're a project manager, um, you and your organization are, are at the center of this process, making decisions. Um, you might have a construction manager that you're working with who represents you um, and, and knows what, what you're looking for. Um, at the core, the developer is the decision maker. Um, 
you're in charge of approving change orders and pay apps and also um, cutting those checks once you, you get those pay apps and, and approve them. All right, so you have your funders. Um, so your, your lenders, investors, um, they are also involved. So they might be, um, they might have um, someone come out um, to your, your monthly draw meetings. Um, they're going to inspect the job as construction goes on um, and they're gonna make sure everything is going as planned and they will be involved if, um, if something is um, way out of budget, if the schedule changes, um, they will definitely be weighing in. All right, um, so you've, you've completed construction, you're on to lease up and operations, which is a very exciting time. Um, you know, you're, you're reaching the end of that construction period and the goal of having tenants move into affordable housing is, is being achieved. Um, so this is a really exciting time. Um, so at the end of construction, you are going to obtain um, a temporary certificate of occupancy or a final certi certificate of occupancy. Um, you might have a grand opening to celebrate this, this really momentous occasion. And lease up will begin, which typically takes um, anywhere from three to six months. Sometimes it can take longer than that if there are delays or, or issues with lease up. And the operations period, as Michelle mentioned earlier, is at least 55 years. So who is a part of this process? Um, so you have um, the property management team um, that um, works on lease up and is on site through the operations period. You have resident services, um, providing services to residents. And then you have um, asset management. We'll talk a little bit more about what each of these three parties do. So property management is responsible for marketing. Um, they do tenant selection. Um, they have a goal of leasing up quickly as a delayed lease up could um, affect the amount of tax credits your project gets. Um, they are responsible for annual income certifications as well as the ongoing operations and maintenance of the property. And then you have resident services um, who work with residents and can provide um, referrals to outside resources or organizations, counseling, um, any conflict resolution if issues come up, and also social activities for the residents. Um, and then you have asset management. So they are now the, the central decision maker um, rather than the development team, which was really driving um, in pre-development and through construction. So asset management um, coordinates with property management and different funders on their requirements. Um, they're responsible for insurance and the reserves of the property, um, as well as um, if a capital needs assessment is required, asset management is the coordinator there. Okay, so funders, um, so funders have closeout requirements, so um, and other regulatory restrictions. So they're still going to be involved to make sure all of their restrictions are in place, um, and they'll often also do um, annual certifications that that need to be met. Um, they'll look at budgets, um, so operating budgets, um, and they also play a role in in credit delivery. So your investor. Um, is, is key to credit delivery there. If HUD is involved, there will be um, separate HUD inspections. Um, so while lease up um, and is happening and operations are beginning, the developer is working with um, the investor and lenders on completing the cost certification and converting to permanent financing. So that includes um, getting your tax credits in, um, any other permanent financing, perhaps from HCD and paying back the construction loan. And then the construction lender is now out of the deal. Um, so the developer is also um, submitting a place in service application to TCAC um, in order to get um, the 8609 and, or the, and the K1 um, and the final equity installment. Um, so often, the investor holds back a piece of the equity um, until the 8609 is received. 
All right, another chat question. So what kinds of decisions made during pre-development have you seen cause issues during construction? Um, so this could be some a decision that was made in the pre-development time that um, you didn't anticipate any issues, but once construction happens, um, something has come up. So is it site selection, team selection, design, financing, or was there another issue that, that came up on a project that you worked on? All right, so now we're going to move on to um, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Pro Forma basic section, and I will pass it on to Diana. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, everyone see that? Okay, great. So I'm Diana Downton with Community Economics. Community Economics has been around for about 40 years and we provide um, technical assistance to nonprofit developers and public agencies and advocates to help put together the financing for um, affordable housing projects. So I'll be presenting um, today the financing portion um, of this introductory um, workshop. So this will be um, a pretty general overview. Uh, there are more advanced learning labs on low-income housing tax credits and some of the some of the geekier, more technical aspects. This is a, a pretty basic overview. Um, so the goal is for you to have kind of a broad brush understanding of the financing of affordable housing. We'll talk about rents. We'll talk about cash flows, development budgets, uh, the, the general financing sources used, how do you fill your, your financing gap. And then um, we also will have a little Excel workbook exercise um, after my presentation. So you don't have to just sit and listen to us the whole time. You'll have a chance to play around with an Excel workbook and try out some scenarios on your own. So here's just a little graphic um, showing the different phases of the financing. So you have your pre-development period of financing, you have your construction period of financing, and you have your permanent period of financing. So during pre-development, um, you're paying for things like your architect to do all that work that John described, to design the building, to you know, evaluate your design feasibility. So that is a primary, um, you know, a primary cost during pre-development. Also other reports, you'll have to do a phase one environmental analysis, a market study, um, and you're you know, spending time and some money assessing the feasibility of your project. So typical sources that are used during pre-development, maybe your local uh, government has some kind of pre-development money available. Uh, you as the developer might have a line of credit or some internal source that you can use during pre-development or um, some, you know, some CDFIs offer pre-development or acquisition loans. That's another primary uh, cost during pre-development is you may have costs for site control or uh, purchasing your land or um, your property. Then, um, so pre-development budget, then after you've got all your financing put together, your design, you've you know, you're all ready to go, you have your construction period financing. That's when the majority of your costs are incurred primarily for construction of your building, which is, which is the largest cost that um, you'll have. So who provides the construction financing? Um, typically, the bulk of it is a construction lender um, who will provide a short-term construction loan. Um, during construction, typically you also will receive about approximately 10% of your tax credit equity. Um, oops, sorry. 
advanced my slide accidentally. Um, so you, you will have a chunk of your tax credit equity available during construction. And then you may also have some, um, some local funds available from your city or county um, that can be uh, available during construction to pay for construction costs. So when you're done with construction, um, that is when your tax credit equity comes in. So you know the, the majority of the tax credit equity comes in at the end of construction and um, repays your construction loan. Then there'll be a few other costs paid at the end, capitalized reserves, some permanent financing costs, your developer fee, um, but the primary cost is repaying the construction loan. Um, the, and then the sources at that time are the tax credit equity, some other public agency financing. Uh, HCD funds typically only come in at uh, permanent conversion, not during construction. And then your permanent mortgage um, will, typically the construction lender may convert a portion of their loan to a permanent mortgage uh, at conversion. Then, um, so that's really the development period sources and uses. Then you go into the operating period where you have costs and uh, sources for that. The costs are things like you know, your operating costs, payroll, maintenance, all the costs you have to run the building and your uh, source for that are the rents that you're getting um, from your tenants and potentially rental subsidies if, you, um, if you're lucky enough to have those. So usually the, what we use to represent um, the feasibility of the project is a financial performa. So it's really a tool that we use to compare and analyze the financing um, of your project and test out different scenarios. And um, basically it's like a puzzle, which is why I love running the numbers. I'm a numbers geek. I love doing the numbers. It's just like a big puzzle. And the performa is your tool to solve the puzzle. Um, and that's my job is to help you solve the puzzle. <laughs> so what we, what we do in the financial performa is we set it up in a way that will be acceptable to lenders, investors who will be potentially providing your financing. So there's you know, typical assumptions that are used um, that the investors and lenders will be expecting. You should also use in your performa. The performa will include your sources to develop the project, all of your development costs, your unit mix, your income targeting, your revenue, operating expenses, and a extended you know, 15 to 20 year cash flow showing how your property will function uh, over the longer term. So just for a second, I want to touch on, you know, why is affordable housing finance different from market rate housing finance? So in market rate housing, the rents are higher. <laughs> so what, it, what that means is that um, you are able to support in a market rate property, maybe a very large permanent mortgage, you might be attracting equity that is getting a return over time from those higher rents. Um, the difference with affordable housing is the rent is low and therefore you can't support a large mortgage. Some of the properties maybe can't support any mortgage at all, or if they can, it's fairly small. Um, and in affordable housing, you have equity, but that equity is generated from the low-income housing tax credits. Um, and then even with a permanent mortgage and equity, the tax credit equity, typically there's a gap still um, because your rents aren't high enough to support a high mortgage. Your development costs are what they are to build the building. So 
you need to find a, uh, a gap source to complete your financing. So we, you know, this, this was, this framing a project um, was covered already somewhat in the rest of the presentation. But I think it's important when you're thinking about your financing, not to just chase the money, um, that you really kind of go into it um, with a vision of what you want your project to be. And although it likely will be shaped by chasing the financing a little bit, um, I think it's really important not to just, you know, go to your financial consultant and say, okay, what's the easiest money? Okay, sure, we'll do veterans, you know? <laughs> um, so I think, it's, I think it's really good to start out with a, a vision and, you know, realize that you might have to tweak it along the way. So talk to your property management, talk to your service providers in the area where you are, um, you know, where your site is located and do some research on the community. So, you know, what are the incomes um, in that community? What are the needs? You know, is it is there need for family housing or homeless housing? Um, so I think it's good to start out with a vision that informs your, uh, your plan for the property. So, this was, this was touched on a little bit um, earlier as well. So, so you, when, you're, when you're putting together your financing, you really start with the operating side. Um, so you start to look at, okay, who am I targeting and what, what are, will be the rents uh, for that population? So um, afford, being affordable means that a household pays only 30% of their income for rent and utilities. So this is just an example chart of for three bedroom unit. This is in Sonoma County. What are the different rents for 30%, 50%, 60% AMI? What's the rent for that? And then you note that you have to deduct out a utility allowance because the affordability metric includes both rent and utility. So the tenant is paying, you know, a lower rent than the maximum rent because there's an assumption that they're paying for utilities as well. And so the rents, you can calculate them yourselves or you can just look them up. Um, TCAC and HCD uh, publish lists of all the AMI uh, rent levels um, in all the counties in California. So now that you know your rents, um, you can calculate your revenue. So how many units of the different sizes at different AMI levels, multiply that times your unit count, 12 months, that's gonna be your revenue. Here it's 934,000. So how do rental subsidies work? So you've calculated your tenant, uh, your tenant paid rents and the revenue that will come from those. So section eight is the primary rental subsidy program. Um, tenants who receive section eight only pay 30% of their income for rent regardless of what their income is. And the section eight program pays the rest up to a maximum contract rent. And there's two types of section eight vouchers. There's tenant based vouchers where the tenant can take that Section 8 voucher and live anywhere they want. And they, they would take that voucher wherever they go, or there are project-based vouchers that are connected to the, a, a particular building. Um, and there, there is a contract to provide the Section 8 for 15 to 20 year contract period. So the project-based vouchers are the ones that we typically want uh, for affordable housing developments. And the, although the tenant-based vouchers are fine too, you know, we'll, we'll take tenants that have tenant-based vouchers, of course, in the buildings. But if you have project-based voucher, it means that a lender, um, because you have a long-term contract, will actually underwrite additional debt or you know, additional term mortgage on that, um, on that Section 8 revenue. Um, it also, of course, just helps your cash flow, your building over time, and makes the property 
more affordable to extremely low income residents in the building. So you've you've figured out what your what your rental revenue is, what your rental subsidies are, and now you will come up with your operating budget. So generally, you talk to property, property management to get this information. You look at, at comparable properties to get this information. You take into account any things you know might be getting more expensive, like utilities or insurance, and you add you know, a cushion on it. You, you come up with your operating expenses by um, you know, analyzing other properties. So now you have your revenues from rents, you have your operating expenses, and you can figure out your cash flow. So you look at your rents, maybe plus some laundry income. You have to include a vacancy allowance because tenants are moving in and out of the building over time. And there may be points where you don't have any rent, you know, coming for some units that are vacant. Then you deduct out some your operating costs, deduct out uh, annual deposit, and you arrive at your net op not the net operating income. And that is how you can then determine how much money is available for debt service. So any net operating income, then you deduct out any debt service, the remaining cash flow is what's called kind of below the line cash flow, which can be used for certain fees, maybe the investor's asset management fee, partnership management fee. It might be deferred, you might have deferred some of your developer fee that can be paid from cash flow, or um, the rest, the remaining amount would repay any soft loans from cities or towns. So lenders and investors typically underwrite properties with the assumption that your rents are, your, your income is increasing two and a half percent and your expenses are increasing three and a half percent. So the expenses are increasing faster than revenue. So how does that impact your long-term cash flow? That can mean over time, that your cash flow goes negative um, over a 15, 20 year period. So that's something as you're setting up your, uh, your unit mix, you need to pay attention to because you need to be able to show that the property will, will be financially feasible for the long term, not just the first five years or so. Okay, so that's that's the, the kind of operating side, the development budget side. Um, so when you're putting together your development budget um, as a project manager, you're talking to many, many of your uh, team members um, and pulling together their information. So talking to a contractor or a cost estimator to figure out your construction costs, talking to an architect, um, and other, uh, you know, engineers and consultants. Uh, your land costs will be part of your development budget. There's a lot of financing costs, especially in affordable housing properties. Uh, a lot of attorneys' fees, um, construction loan interest. So, certainly, if you're a project manager, a lot of your job is assembling your development budget information. Also developer fee, that's the way that your organization gets paid for all the work that you're putting in and all the risk you're taking by, uh, by developing the property. And by the way, Michelle, if there, if there are questions or you know, feel free to pop up at at any time. <laughs> yes, I'll let you know. And and, and I haven't seen a, 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 feel free anybody who has a question to put in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we can also have a, a more time for Q&A at the end or during the exercise uh, period as well. 
So in terms of sizing the permanent mortgage, um, the, the lender will look at your net operating income and then apply, apply a debt service coverage ratio to that. Uh, that debt service coverage ratio is typically 1.15 or higher. And the debt service coverage ratio needs to stay above about 1.1 for the term of the loan. So in other words, your, your cash flow is always gonna be about 15% higher than your loan payment because the lender wants to make sure that they're gonna get paid. So they always underwrite with a cushion so that if there's a change to the operating expenses over time, they're gonna get their payment every year. And permanent mortgages are typically amortized on a fixed payment schedule for 30, 35 years, sometimes 20 years. So it's a fixed payment. Each payment is you know, a different proportion of interest and principal, just like maybe you might get a perm mortgage on, uh, on your own home. So you've, you've determined what your permanent mortgage is. Now it's time to look at how much tax credit equity you will be able to leverage for uh, as a source. So the low income housing tax credit program is certainly, I would say the, the largest uh, financing program for affordable housing development and is used on pretty much all, uh, all affordable housing projects, at least rental affordable housing projects these days. Um, it's been around since 1986, and there are two types of credits, 9% credits and 4% credits. Uh, today, I'll be focusing a bit more on the 4% tax credits, just because it's, it's um, a little simpler and we don't have a lot of time to go into all the, the details of tax credits. Um, so, but the, the tax credit program provides an annual credit against taxes for 10 years to owners of qualified housing. So the investor joins your partnership as a, you know, in, in your property as a part owner and therefore is able to take those tax credits over 10 years. But what they do is they pay you upfront for that. So uh, they're getting the credit over 10 years, but they give you all the money up front to be able to build your property. The investor is also taking other tax benefits um, from the property, um, typically generated by depreciation, which generates losses for the investor that also is a tax benefit to them. So the capture period for tax credits. So the investor is usually in your partnership for 15 years um, and they will be monitoring um, the operations and the delivery of their credits. Um, you know, the credits are delivered over 10 years, but they will be typically involved for at least 12 to 15 years until they exit the partnership. So how do you calculate the tax credits? So to, to, an important concept for calculating tax credits is eligible basis. So costs that are included in eligible basis are anything that is necessary for construction of your building. So the hard costs, the architecture and engineering, the permits and impact fees, developer fee, and any construction period financing. So most costs um, will, be involved, will be part of eligible basis. Um, also, I, I won't get into too much detail, but acquisition of an existing building can also be an eligible basis. But there are a number of costs that are not an eligible basis, which includes land, so any land-related costs cannot be in basis. Uh, perm, permanent financing costs, capitalized reserves, 
any interest that's incurred after construction completion, uh, any costs related to tax credit syndication, also any costs related to a commercial space, um, except for under certain conditions, but in most cases, only residential costs um, can be included in eligible basis. Another important concept to understand uh, around calculating your tax credits is threshold basis limits. So threshold basis limits are kind of the TCAX method of capturing what, what are reasonable costs. And so TCAC publishes every year uh, threshold basis limits for every county um, in California for different unit sizes. Um, so when you're calculating your tax credits, you also need to check that your eligible basis is not above the threshold basis limits. Um, the threshold basis limits also have a number of adjustments to them to reflect the fact that some factors will make your development more expensive. So if you have prevailing wage, if you have structured parking, um, if you're 100% special needs, if you have an elevator, so they have all these adjustments to, to the threshold basis limits. Um, also affordability is an adjustment for 4%. Uh, tax credit for four percent tax credits. Um, so you need to understand that there are these threshold basis limits um, when you're looking at your eligible basis and when, you're, and when you're calculating your eligible basis and your tax credits. So here's just a little very simple uh, budget showing what is and it what what is and isn't in eligible basis so you're, there's your costs and then on the right eligible basis which doesn't include land it doesn't include farm financing and it doesn't include reserves but it includes most other development costs so here your eligible basis is 26.7 million So I'll walk through just a basic tax credit calculation for a 4% project. You have your eligible basis, the 26.7 million. Then if your property is in a DDA, which is a, I think it's difficult to develop area, or a QCT, a qualified census tract, um, you get a boost to your eligible basis of 30%. Um, I think that Adrian mentioned that that that's something you should be mindful of when you're looking at sites is that it can be helpful if your property is in a DBA or a QCT. You can just look that up. Um, you know, you can search for DDA QCT lookup and there's a nice little tool where you can look up whether your property is in a DBA or a QCT. So you get a 30% boost. So you multiply your eligible basis times 30% and you have now 34.7 million in eligible basis. You multiply that called, uh, you multiply that by the applicable fraction. What that means is that's just how much of your property is eligible for tax credits. So as long as all of your units are restricted below 80% of AMI, you should be able to get tax credits on all your units and you would be 100% 100 uh, 100 tax credit property. So that's you know, what we see most people doing are 100% affordable properties. So then you take the resulting qualified basis and you multiply it times the 4% credit rate and you come up with your annual tax credit. So this is your annual credit. The, that credit is taken over 10 years. So you multiply that times 10 and you now have your total tax credits. But 
the investor doesn't always want to pay you a dollar for every every uh, tax credit you're getting. They're going to pay you less. So when you're calculating the tax credit equity, you take your total tax credits and multiply them times the price that you think you know that you think or that your investor tells you they will pay for those credits. So here I've assumed ninety cents. And the final investor equity is about 12.5 million. Okay, so we're, we're moving our way along here, figuring out our financial feasibility. We've calculated our PERM loan. We've estimated our tax credit equity. Now we need to figure out, is that enough? You know, did, is that gonna pay for our development? So, your, let's say, for example, your mortgage is, you think you can support a $5 million mortgage. You are going to estimate you can get 13 million in tax credit equity. That's 18 million in, in sources, but your property is gonna cost $30 million. So you still have $12 million that you need to find. So you go shopping for money. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, though, it's not this easy. You know, you can't just go grab some, you know, gap financing off the shelf. So you probably have to do some of this. <laughs> um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, advocacy and work that needs to go into making sure that the money that we use for gap financing for our properties is available. So there's a lot of advocacy for the bond measures, for the local state bond measures, lobbying the governor. So this is an ongoing task that we all face um, is making sure that we have this gap financing. So um, yeah, so those, you know, those financing sources are, are never quite enough, um, but we all keep working for more. <laughs> so, so some of the sources of, um, of these gap, you know, these gap financing sources could be your local governments, your cities and counties, they may have home or CDBG, local housing trust funds, they may have, there may have been a local bond or fee that is, you know, creating some sources that they can provide. Then the, the state of California Department of Housing and Community Development has a laundry list of programs, um, the multifamily housing program. I won't read all the names, but um, they have a number of programs. They have a a website that has um, a, you know, a lot of information. They're going through a process right now of trying to streamline that process so it's easier to apply for their financing sources. Uh, the affordable housing program is run by the Federal Home Loan Bank. And then you know maybe there's some sponsor funds that you have um, or you have to potentially recontribute some developer fee if you have to or defer some developer fee to help make a project financially feasible. Um, so this isn't an exhaustive list. There are other, other sources available, but um, these are probably the primary uh, gap financing sources that people that I see people using. So what, what does it mean when we say soft debt? Basically, that means that you're not required to pay a payment um, every year like you are with hard, with hard debt. So these are typically residual receipts. They're paid from cash flow only if there's cash flow actually available from the operations of your property to, to repay those loans. Usually they're 55 year loans and they um, and they have you know low zero to three percent interest rates. And it's really important that you understand your sources. And um, 
you know, you really will need to read the program guidelines, even though they're long, <laughs> you need to read them um, because all the programs have, um, are very competitive and they have a lot of requirements, threshold requirements, scoring requirements, uh, readiness, green building, site amenities, targeting, um, and so you do, you will need to read the program guidelines. Of course, your financial consultant will help you with that, but you will need to read the guidelines. So some helpful websites, you know, TCAC, HCD, there's a lot of, again, kind of tedious information, but it's important to, to read them, uh, read the Uniform Multifamily Regulations, which is HCD's underwriting requirements. You know, the TCAC, um, the TCAC regulations, they have a lot of the information about TCAC underwriting. So it's good to be familiarized with um, these documents. So I think that's really all of my presentation. Um, I think I'll see if there are any, if there's any questions. And um, if not, then we could break for maybe take a break first, a brief break, and then um, go into breakout rooms and work on an Excel exercise. Um, Michelle, did you wanna? Yeah, so let's do just a couple of things. Um, Gavin, are you and your team up and available to pop in the, the latest poll question? Um, yep. uh, poll two? Or will you jump in the poll three? Poll two, okay. And poll T, I'm sorry, two, poll two, is what's your current level of uh, comfort with performance? Um, by way of background, I'm one of those folks that was drawn to affordable housing because I loved the numbers part. What was it, 12% of respondents? And, um, and so the majority of you, yeah, you're coming to us ready to learn quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. And so the, you know, the exercise that I that I that I have for you should be fairly, fairly introductory. Um, hopefully people have some exposure to Excel. I would think people do. It's in Excel. Um, and I believe that there will be a link posted in the chat that will allow people to download that. Gavin, would you and your, your folks go ahead and post the handout for handout CEI Performa exercises? There you go. Aha, uh -huh, there it is. And um, just, I guess, so people can work on making sure that they can access that document. We'll give a couple minutes for that, and maybe I can share my screen and kind of show the exercise um, and introduce people to it. I also see a question, why is land not covered by tax credits? Um, so the idea is, is that eligible basis has to do with your building um, and the residential building on it, whereas the land could be used for you know anything. It could be used for commercial, it could be used for a parking lot, it could be used. So the building is really the affordable asset. Um, and uh, so that, that's the general concept. Gavin, it looks like there's a, a problem with the link. So maybe we could try that again. And I'll add just a little bit of uh, color also with um, uh, basis. Um, so land is um, doesn't depreciate uh, where your the useful life or the sticks that you use to build your building those depreciate run out of useful life as they get older. Right. But land does not, and so it's a tax. It's a tax reason. It's a tax concept. Um, and then Gavin says that everybody needs to download the link. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's a link to a Dropbox to access the uh, document. So it's not going to take you to a uh, you know it's not going to just be an immediate download. It's going to take you to a Dropbox link that you then download from there. Sorry if that's confusing. Mm -hmm. And I see that some yeah, and then may you, have you you click download. Yeah, you click right the link and it'll take you to a Dropbox and then you hit the download from there. So it's I I drop these documents into a drop into a Dropbox folder. Okay, so why don't we why don't we give people a couple of minutes? What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, before we start the exercise, we'll go ahead and take a ten minute break until three ten. And what we're gonna do afterwards is at three ten, we'll come back and Gavin will. Gavin and his team will put us into breakout rooms, um, four breakout rooms. Each breakout room will have a developer um, uh, helping um, navigate the exercise. And is that okay, uh, Diana? Or did you want to give instructions before we go into the breakout rooms? Um, it might be a good idea to do instructions before everyone goes into the breakout rooms. Uh, just before yeah before we all disperse i hope people are going to be able to access the exercise um but <laughs> why don't um so at 3 10 um just take a stretch break and get a quick bite to eat 3 10 we'll reconvene and we'll get this link figured out we'll get instructions um, then we'll break out into rooms and you'll each get a developer to, to help you with the exercise. Yes. Okay. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can we see, let's see, is there, are folks generally able to access the Excel. I'm just gonna stare at the chat. Yes, I got a yes. Yeah, we need we need another poll. I don't know if we can do that off the cuff. Some yeses. Got two yeses. That's a good sign. Excellent. Okay. Looking like we're in good shape. Um, Diana, would you like to go ahead and uh, give us instructions on how to proceed? Sure. I'll share my screen just to pull up the, the workbook. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. So there are three tabs in the Excel workbook, the unit mix and cash flow, the development budget, and the tax credit calcs. And the way that this is formatted is that the areas that are highlighted in yellow is where you are meant to input information. Um, the green areas are just areas that, you know, we've already filled in for you that information. And then on the right is a description of the exercise. And so the exercise is a combination of you inputting information and then just thinking about that information and um, the, the decisions or the, the thought process that you might go through as you were setting up the financial feasibility of your project. So hopefully the instructions um, if the, for the exercise are fairly straightforward. I will mention if there could be some Excel quirks um, 
around what your formula settings are. So if we're in the breakout rooms and, and it seems that the spreadsheet is not automatically calculating, because what should happen is when you enter the information, it should automatically self calculate and um, update based on the information that you entered. If it's not doing that, then in the breakout rooms, we can kind of help troubleshoot that with your formula settings. So there's a unit mix and a cash flow here for you to look at. Um, and then in the development budget, similar setup, yellow areas for you to fill in exercises that includes, you know, putting in what you think is an eligible basis, and that will automatically calculate your tax credit equity, which is on this tax credit calcs tab. There's not a lot to do on the tax credit calc tab, but it just kind of lays out that calculation for you. And, you know, you could even probably use this later, <laughs> this, you know, setup to run numbers on a project. It's a very basic um, spreadsheet. So I think that may be all I need to say. Um, I think we'll break into, we'll go into breakout rooms and the, the way this is set up is people can do it very independently. If you wanna talk with each other and ask questions, we can do that or do it through the chat. Um, so, yeah, that's the idea. And Gavin, if you could um, break us out into breakout rooms and put one developer in each room, that would be great. And all we anticipate taking 45 minutes with this exercise. Yeah, I'm not sure we'll need that much, but um, I guess people can take a break if they have extra time. <laughs> Yeah, we're all set and ready to go. I'll I'll send everyone the breakouts if you're if you're ready. Yeah, and then Michelle, have you told people what's coming next after this? Just so after this, there'll be a, a nut. What what will happen after? After this, we have um, we're going sorry, going into the run of show. We're going to be speaking with Denise Wint, our experienced um, VP of real estate for EAH housing. She's going to be leading us in um, an exercise about uh, um, activities and timeframes during the pre-development phases, um, basically like what comes first, second, and third. Um, and then after that exercise, we'll again, actually during that exercise, we'll again break out into smaller rooms so you'll have a developer to chat with about the time frames and then after that we're going to have a more intimate discussion with Denise about what brings her to um, development and her experiences here and that's it okay going to breakouts thank you Thank you, Gavin. My apologies if that was a little bumpy. We made it. We totally made it. Um, all right. Um, I'm sure that there's questions. Um, and but we're not going to take them. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Um, honestly, uh, folks, feel free to reach out to, to any any of us on this uh, mm -hmm. on this presentation, and um, we'd be happy to spend time with you. Um, the performers are are um, a lot of art as well as science, and um, and you just get better with time. Um, so we, yeah, anyone feel free to reach out to me. Um, so the, my emails on the PowerPoint presentation that hopefully you can get a hold of. So we are going to move right into actually another exercise. So Gavin, don't go far. Um, 
the the next exercise is about um, the steps that you need to think about in the pre-development process. And actually, I just realized that I need to get my PowerPoint up so that I can share it with you all. Oh, shoot. I see Gavin just posted the link to the next exercise. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Adrian, can you do me a favor? Sure. Like lost in my screens. Can you get that, get the PowerPoint up just to the, the pages to Denise? Yes. Oh, geez. I am like. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Denise, you're up. All right, I'm excited. So another hands-on activity wouldn't it's not gonna be as a as the it's not like what we just went through with the Excel spreadsheet, even though folks really learned a lot from it and was able to take away. So this one is now more of the pre-development planning. So you're moving your project forward and you gotta go through some critical tasks in a timeline in order for your project to, to move through. So this exercise asks you to consider typical tasks completed during the initial one or two, two to three months of a development project. You're to create a two dimensional timeline or critical path using the information provided. The tasks outlined in the list of tasks and activities and the blank timeline. So that's what was just provided to you in the Zoom chat. And I believe it'll be posted in the HOVA chat as well. So remember that many of the tasks are interrelated, although they're they all do not fall into the same column. There is more than one right answer and lots of wrong answers to this exercise and not every box needs to have an activity. So it's kind of like those activities or those tests where it's just, it's like doing your driver's test. Don't pay attention to the real life situation. <laughs> just do, just follow what's on the form and then that'll get you through. The real life world will definitely change how some of these things work, but this is similar to what that exercise is, just to help you to just manage expectations. So the if you have access to the, the link, just let us know in the chat. And so the next slide will just let you know about the background. So you are a project manager and the developer that you work for is Silver, Hammer Housing Corporation, and it's in the conceptual stage or so the early stage of the development for a medium-sized 50 to 75 unit new rental housing project in the city of Shady Gardens. Sorry, I just had a golden girls moment of thinking of Shady Pines. So this project manager's first, this is the project manager's first tax credit project, and SHHC has successfully applied for tax credits in the past. And SHHC has operated a rental rehabilitation loan program for low-income house homeowners for seven years. So SHHC would rather not spend its own funds on early pre-development activities, but might be willing to risk $25,000 if necessary. SHHC also has no in-house design capabilities, so they need to an architect to know how many units can be built? So here are the assumptions and the rules. It's only one task per category based on the two week interval. Consultants require a retainer per the amount listed in the task activity. So you gotta pay something up front. Home and CDBG, so these are our federal funds and this is gonna be administered by Maxwell County. 
in order to apply for the gap funding, which we just discussed in our in our performer exercise. So what's the need? You need to have site control, local support. So a letter of support from the city of Shady Gardens, a financing plan. So looking at your numbers that you just went over, a conceptual design, so just preliminary designs and cost estimates for your construction. Assume Maxwell County has a pre-development loan program. In order to apply, you need site control and the financing plan. The pre-development loan is funded two weeks after submitting a complete application. And to get City of Shady Gardens letter of support, you must have met with you must have first met with neighbors. Mm. The city can issue a support letter in four weeks if you provide evidence of site control, a development performa, and city staff supports the site plan after first meeting with them. So these are the tasks that you will go through. So this starts from initiating the purchase negotiations and working with a broker if you need, hiring, the various consultants of so your attorney, your architect, understanding what requirements are needed from the county itself. You need to have some initial monies to go in and do you have those resources? Remember how much uh, the, the developer is gonna be able to put in, you have to do your performa. So again, you're taking these tasks and putting it into the respective timeline in order for you to understand what it will take for you to get your project to being supported by the city. So we could post the link again. So this is the, ti the timeline template. So you have starting from week one and two all the way to weeks 21 and 22. So in each column, you're gonna take one of those tasks that we had previously shared and identify where it goes. If it's site related, you'll put it there and in which timeline it will go. Financing again, you'll take the task from the timeline and put it into its respective week. So if you need I don't know, money from the city to buy the land, where would that go? Then what activities do you have to do that's related to the community or understanding the market or the residents that you're targeting. And then lastly, we have planning and design. So you have the, the Word documents for you to fill in those tasks. So just copy and paste into the timeline. And then we'll, I think we're gonna break out into individual groups again. Mm -hmm. You can work on it individually and then discuss it collectively as a group, and then we'll reconvene. And we'll reconvene at 4.30. Okay. Adrian, I'm gonna have you put up the PowerPoint again. I don't know where it's, it's lost somewhere on my desktop. Give me a second. Thank you. Are we sharing the answers? Yeah, we're gonna share the answers. I mean, I I was like running through it in the background. I don't know if anybody else actually got through it. I like ran and didn't get through it. So we're gonna distribute the answers as well. But I mean, there were there were, you know, 28 activities that your response, I'm sorry, Denise, I should let you. No, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, there were 28 activities that were listed there, all of which are things that you actually do in real life. Um, 22 weeks. I'm trying to decide if that's fast for that the level of activity. And I don't think it is actually, but um. And yeah, you're sort of constantly dealing with like, what's gotta go first, what's gotta go second, who do I need to talk to? One of the, the um, sort of takeaways 
um, that I mentioned to my group is that you're always going to end with the funding applications. Like you're or always going to have like everything else done um, before you go to, you know, certainly before you go to SIDLAC and TCAC, those are always the final steps that you're going to take. The, in these, in today's sort of market, any funder, whether it be for project base up vouchers or, you know, local funds, um, HCD, they're always going to really want you to be, you know, almost shovel ready before you go talk to them about getting money. Denise, would you, would you? Uh... I would say something that was coming up with, with a couple of participants in our last group was just, you know, trying to understand where each task should go, how soon or how much later do they need to come in, and then also being mindful of our pre-development budget. Like, we need this done, we need this done, we need this done, but we're running out of our funds to be able to do some of these reports or to do put down a deposit. When do we, when do we have those activities come into play? Yeah, in places where I've worked, I don't, maybe you can talk about how EAH sort of approaches their pre-development funding. Um, I've worked at places that are, that basically say no way, no how are we working off of our balance sheet? And then I've worked at places that have let their balance sheet run pretty high. Yeah, same here. Yeah. But I thought this exercise was really good because it helped to think about when certain things really need to happen and who needs to be engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the people here, all the people here need to be engaged. Your financial consultant needs to be engaged here. Certainly your BP of real estate obviously needs to be engaged. Um, and John Egan, who we heard from at the beginning. Do we want to say more about the exercise or do we want to just jump into interviewing uh, Ms. Denise? All right, hearing no protests. Um, maybe Adrian, you bring down the screen maybe? All right, there's, there's Denise. Um, so I am going to ask Denise some of the chat questions that I posed to folks in this, um, throughout this Zoom meeting. And maybe Denise, I'm gonna say what I know about Denise and then I'm gonna have her introduce herself uh, sort of formally. I know, I know you've been involved in affordable housing for about 15 years. You went to USC for planning school um, and you are the vice president of real estate development for EAH, which is based in San Rafael. And it's one of the biggest affordable housing developers in the state. Um, what else would you like to tell us before we get started? I am happy to be here. <laughs> this is one of my, I enjoyed this class. I remember taking it as well and starting out. I started out as an intern, so you can definitely grow in, in many ways in this, in, this, in this field. And you were an intern with a boat, is that right? I was an intern with a boat. Yes, I was an both communities in LA, yeah. And now I get to work with great project managers and great assistant project managers and analysts and interns who get to work on our projects throughout the state. So they get to see a lot of all of these activities that we've been doing today, they see it throughout the state and it's very different across the board. So I'm excited. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start you off with the uh, the poll question that we asked at the beginning. Which term best describes what drew you to affordable housing? Did you aspire to be a community developer, a numbers and performa expert, a placemaker, or a policymaker? And then tell us a little bit more. Uh, I think it started out as a policy person because that's where I got my, my master's in from USC. And I learned about community development and saw that I could do that as a potential career. And I started working with the city, but then 
when I saw the physical transformation of communities, it was, no, I'm a community developer. I like seeing how communities are truly transformed from just, the, not only just from the building itself, but the beyond the building. So how the neighborhoods, how people are more engaged in their neighborhoods, when you see certain retailers coming in because we have activity and people engaged, I think that's when that's, that mindset shifted for me. Fantastic. <laughs> um, when you started, what was your level of comfort with pro formas? I thought I was confident in it because we were doing it in school, but it was like these, it was much, simpler than what Diana pro 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 provided here today. So I was like, oh, this is easy. And then I started out at a boat and looked at the performance like, this is nothing what we reviewed <laughs> in class. It was way too easy. I mean, you see these huge Excel spreadsheets in front of me where I thought I was good in Excel. And it's like, no, there's a lot more to Excel that you don't know about, but at least you can add and subtract and multiply and divide and there are lots of videos online that it can help you. And then being in that space, the project managers that I was working with were really helpful and just eager to assist in understanding. And it was, all right, I just got to sit here and figure out what these numbers mean. And eventually with all of the different projects that we worked on and I got to work on throughout the years, it became a lot easier. That's great. I actually and, but these sessions are really helpful though as, as refreshers for me. So I appreciate it too. I actually started out, I was actually a CPA before my life in affordable housing. And so when I came into affordable housing, I was like, pro forma. And um, I have many days get my sort of butt kicked by pro formas and not being able to figure out what it is that, that they're trying to make me do. Yeah, and sometimes it'd be something so simple, but I've learned to just get up and walk away and focus on something else and then come back to it. Very good, very good. But I could also say that it's helpful to have organizations like CHP, like who you work for and Diana to be the, to scrub the numbers and be those extra set of eyes because when I was growing up in the industry, we didn't rely on consultants. It was, you work on this on your own and we'll work on it as a group and we'll check each other's numbers. But because you guys stay in this all the time, you understand the changes that come up a lot more frequently than I would. And so it's helpful to have that balance as well. So it's, it's been a good experience. Thank you. Um, when deciding on a new project from scratch, where have you seen or led EAH to start? Um, I'll give you the options, but I suspect it's gonna be, well, anyway. Do you look at the latest funding sources and try hard to find land to match them? Do you see what funding source comes next in the HCD calendar and try to find land to match it? Do you ever decide a site is just too great to pass up and the development team will make it work no matter what? Um, or do you have folks research land that has become more developable as a result of land use and state density bonus laws? Yes, to yes. all. <laughs> yes to all I've seen within EAH again we're throughout the state of California and Hawaii so it can work all of those answers where we would have someone research to understand who has funds because we understand how especially gets where we are in this phase it's getting more and more competitive things are getting more and more expensive. So even if we've identified a locality that has some funds, how much money do they have? Because, you know, they may say, well, we have money. It's, we have $3 million. Is that gonna be enough to go towards a site to say if you're in, a, uh, in an area where land is expensive, say it's $6 million to purchase that land, is that $3 million gonna be enough to go towards the rest of the project? So I've seen that, uh, we've seen it where um, it's just like, okay, well, this is the population that this entity or this municipality is looking to target. How can we provide assistance in, in that phase? 
can we go there? But I've seen it across the board where we look at all different aspects. It's not one path to the end goal. There are multiple paths and we've taken all of them to get to the point where we can develop the housing, but certainly multiple paths in order to get there. So we do look at all of it. Um, when value engineering, where do you upgrade or downgrade first? And what do you just hate cutting? I don't like value engineering. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like, again, it depends on where we are. Because in some cities, we have to upgrade the exterior finishes. And we know when we upgrade, it's adding a lot of money to the project. And we have to find additional resources in order to cover that. And oftentimes when we're doing these conceptual designs and we get the public feedback and we get the local support from the staff, it's the exterior that they see. And that's what folks fall in love with. It's like, oh, wow, look at all these trees. Look at how it's gonna look within the neighborhood. So that's one of the hardest ones, the hardest part of the whole value engineering as far as what can I take out of the project in order to reduce the cost. And I've been told that oftentimes what helps reduce costs is inside the walls. Mm -hmm. And if you can reduce that, that could possibly help, but sometimes it leads to, okay, well, we said we're gonna do this brick facade building and we may be able to do it on the first floor and on a couple of other floors. It's like, it just starts shifting the, the, the initial concept that we were going with, but you know, we have to just be safe or careful to not fall in love too much with the design because it can certainly change through throughout. So I would say we try to see what we can do within the walls. Uh, one example that came up or has been coming up is insurance and the cost of insurance during construction and once it's in operation. And we had to look at changing from wood framing to metal framing. And there was a substantial cost savings, but then it affected the project and other aspects of, of obtaining certain green standards and heat gain and loss. So, you know, it just continues to shift the whole narrative around the project, but it's not my favorite exercise to go through, but when we can, we'll try to upgrade. If we see that we're gonna have some project savings, it's like, okay, well, can we make the landscaping look lush? You know, because in some instances it's like, okay, well, we can't have these full mature trees. We have to go with the ones that are just starting out and it may take 15 years for them to look good. Um, how can we help with the, the landscaping, the, um, the, the waterproofing, how do you, help with the parking as John had mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of different things that we have to take into consideration, but what's been helpful for us is having the architect and the contractor work through these, pro um, work through these challenges early. So once we're in the design phase, like, okay, if we bring in, if we bring in these materials, would that help reduce the cost? Um, and also with EAH, we have our design standards and respects that we work through with facility, property management. We had a lot of internal conversations about what's been working, what's not working, how do we improve? Do we need to make, this is what we're looking for and we know the costs of these things. So how that's also been helpful for us as well. Great, thank you. Um, what kinds of decisions made during pre-development have you seen cause issues during construction? Um, site selection, team selection, design and financing. Uh, where do you, uh, where do you wanna go with that? <laughs> well, with the amount of projects that EH has and the amount of projects that I've worked on, you do see issues on that's come up with all of those things. I've seen it where we've changed team, whether it's on the design side, the architects, the lead architect on this on the project has changed multiple times, or on the on the general contractor where the, the superintendent or the project manager has changed multiple times. 
and because we probably needed it because somebody just wasn't doing what they needed to do. Or in, in this world that we're in now, the project manager may have changed. And so we need to get somebody up to speed on that uh, financing to some unexpected cost. You've gone through your whole environmental reporting and assessment and the site is clean. Then you start construction and you realize that there are under storage tanks somewhere and you got to deal with that. Or, you know, the, <laughs> I was sharing with someone the other day, one of the projects that I had worked on, we didn't see on the map that there were conduits serving a quarter of Los Angeles that were coming from AT&T. No map showed it. And the contractor was about to, um, they're about to remove some asphalt and, and we ended up finding out because the superintendent just stuck his head underneath one of the manholes, it was about eight inches below that, eight inches below the surface and they were in clay pipes. So then that had to stop construction somewhat in order for us to then figure out how can we protect these clay pipes that were serving a quarter of the city of Los Angeles. So I'm just one site that nobody knew about. So there's so many things, the design, the transformer, that's something else that tends to come up <laughs> where it was just like we were two or a few inches. It's like you're within one inch of how the where the transformer could be rolled or located, and if you can't make the necessary adjustments, you would have to start the design process all over again. It's like how can we do that? We're about to break ground. So, like I said, all of the above. But it's exciting. <laughs> you learn so much from all of these projects. So then it's like, okay, what can I avoid in my next project? And then it, the list just just gets longer and longer, and then eventually you'll run into that perfect project. I, I I tend to agree with you. Well, except for the perfect project that's done. <laughs> I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> I tend to agree. I love I loved my time as a developer and uh, love watching it from the sidelines nowadays. <laughs> so yeah, I'm there. I'm there too. It's like my heart has ran its course with that, and so I get to support my team to go through those exciting moments, and it's exciting. That's great. Um. Well, I, we have one more poll for the folks out there. Um, so if Gavin is listening, if he could just put up the poll that says, you know, asks you if you found this helpful. Um, and if he doesn't put up the poll, that's fine. Um, let somebody know if you found it helpful or not. We really um, enjoyed putting it together. I hope that showed. And we really hope that you all um, got so much out of it. Honestly, feel free to contact any of us if you have any questions. Um, not just about what you heard, but any other any other thing that you want to learn about um, in this industry. It's a it's a really wonderful industry with wonderful people, and so welcome to it and housing California, I guess officially. And thank you all. That's it, <laughs> Michelle. Thanks for putting this together. I know with you and Diana and Adrian being in this virtual space. It, it still worked. And I know it was a lot just from the performa and a lot just going through the phases of development, but it, it very much worked out where we can just focus our time and just at least understanding certain concepts. And then it's up to us to put all of these things into practice. Yes, so thank Diana, you. thank you so much. Adrian, thank you so much. Denise, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. All right, enjoy the conference, everyone. Bye. Thank you.